in a way we're distinct from one another, but both are located beneath the modern village of Polis Chrysokus and the nearby surrounding area. We'll be looking at this aerial view again in just a, in just a bit to get a better idea of where we excavated. But first a bit of background information. Marion is the earlier of the two cities. We're not entirely sure when Marion was initially founded. In our work, we discovered, excuse me, in our work, we discovered uh, material as early as the late Chalcolithic period around 2500 BC, but we actually have very little that dates from that time, mostly a few pieces of broken pottery. Evidence for Bronze Age occupation is more plentiful with additional sherds found in excavation. Work done by the Department of Antiquities outside of Polis to the Northeast in the 1960s and 1990s uncovered chamber tombs of pottery that you see here, confirming Bronze Age settlement in the area. Bronze Age activity has further been substantiated by Kate Grossman and Tate Paulette's work in Magunda and Daria Malashevsky's survey of the Northwest coast of the island. It is during the Iron Age that Marion was established as one of the ancient city kingdoms of the island. The material culture of the city was further confirmed by the work of the Swedish Cyprus expedition, which excavated 98 tombs in the area of Polis from March to July of 1929. Those tombs dated from the geometric to the Hellenistic periods. Subsequent work in the area by the Department of Antiquities, notably by Kyriakos Nikolaou and later by Stathis Raptu, has been critical. However important Marion had been during the Iron Age, her eclipse involved these two men. Although Cyprus was freed from Persian rule by Alexander the Great, after his death in 323 BC, his generals struggled among themselves to control for control of his kingdom, and Cyprus was part of the collateral damage. Having sided with the wrong general in the wars of the Diadochi in the aftermath of Alexander's death, ancient Marion was leveled to the ground and the population was deported to Paphos. This was done by order of Ptolemy I in 312 BC. In the year 270 BC, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who by then was already sitting on the throne of Egypt, decided to establish a new city at the site to replace Marion. He called it Arsinoe after his wife and sister. The city flourished throughout the Hellenistic period. Its prosperity may have lapsed somewhat during the Roman period, and certainly during the late antique, Byzantine, and medieval periods, its situation improved and it ultimately was eclipsed by the modern town of Polis. It was in the year 1983 that Princeton University began its work in the Polis region and our team has been occupied by digging, studying and publishing what we have found every year since then. I had already mentioned that there had been previous exploration in the region by others so you might be asking yourselves the question, what was there left for us to do? Earlier archeological work had primarily focused on tombs and their contents. As important as that information is, a grave cannot really tell you much about how an ancient people actually lived. So the Princeton team decided to excavate the ancient cities associated with the cemeteries that had been previously discovered we wanted to take a look at where and how the people negotiated their lives. And in the course of our work, there was a great deal to explore, as you see here in some of the views of the excavation. The material remains were also impressive, dating to all phases of the existence of Marion and Arsinoe. Objects have been found in various contexts and as you can see in different media. During the time we've excavated in the wider Polis area, we ended up opening over 300 different trenches. 
The aerial view that you see here was taken with the help of a Cypress National Police helicopter. And I, uh, I have to report to you, um, I took the photograph. I was leaning out the open door of the helicopter tethered by a single strap. I'm deathly afraid of heights. So um, uh, this was the best thing anybody can ever do to get cured of their phobia of heights anyway. So here we see the water uh, polis area. I've marked five major zones where we carried out excavation. Um, three areas are within the town while the other two are on the outskirts of polis. Some of our work has been done within the limits of the town, as you can see with the red rectangle, and the presence of modern structures as well as the proximity of topsoil to ancient remains has complicated excavation. The same has been true in trenches dug in agricultural areas where plowing has removed surface soils as well as precious information about architecture and the material culture of the two ancient cities. One of the most complex areas that we've uncovered is this large trench, which we call EF2, named after the section of the Princeton grid we've imposed on the area. Both remains of Marion and Arsinoe have been found here, but it is the later city, Arsinoe, that dominates. Here we have an urban area that included workshops devoted to craft production in Arsinoe, lamps, glass, metal, and terracotta figurines, slight evidence of domestic structures, perhaps occupied by artisans, and more impressive remains of the late antique and Byzantine periods when the economy clearly boomed with the construction of significant buildings. The most prominent structure is a three-aisled basilica initially constructed in the mid to late 6th century and undergoing subsequent additions and renovations. The plan and an artist's reconstruction give you a better idea of what it might have looked like. Typical for the period, the plan reflects a central nave bounded by side aisles. The nave and south portico were added later. Hundreds of stone and glass tesserae, some with gold leaf, indicate that the interior had mosaic decoration, and painted plaster and fragments of marble revetment were also recovered. Throughout its long history, until the 11th century, 250 burials were associated with the structure, and to the west, a well house was constructed. These are just a few of the scores of objects that were discovered. The decorative crosses were found in burials and were worn around the necks of the deceased. The mosaic is one of hundreds found that had fallen from the ceiling and walls. The lampstand is made of bronze and would have burned and illuminated the inside of the church, while the marble panel with cross decorated the interior. This slide shows some of the striking objects associated with the Hellenistic and Roman levels of the area. The plate comes from the domestic residence and its bright orange red color and profile corroborate a date in the second century BC. The lamps were some of the several hundred associated with the Roman lamp kiln. And you can see that these three were all produced from the same mold. The three coins date to the Roman imperial period with the emperor's portrait and inscription still clearly visible. And from left to right, they are Antoninus Pius, Diocletian, and Marcus Aurelius. The little clay incense burner likely functioned inside someone's private home, and perhaps it lit, it lit the interior of the house or shop of the artisan who made the terracotta figurines. Another area within Polis that has been excavated and revealed complicated archaeology is this one, EGO, again named after the Princeton grid square designation. 
The different walls date to the Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine, medieval, and even the modern era, with dates extending from 300 BC until 1983, when we first started digging. The major remains are an administrative building from the Hellenistic and early Roman periods outlined in green and another Christian basilica outlined in blue, also three aisled and slightly larger than the one we just looked at. Its initial construction dates to sometime in the seventh century AD and note the long row of ossuaries along its northern flank that included skeletons, of course, but also coins, pottery, belt buckles, and lamps. I show you some very interesting items found during excavation. The church had a mosaic floor which survived in limited areas made out of various colored stone tesserae and set in different patterns. Several burials were associated with the church and this skeleton is that of a woman. Although the deceased were Christians, one was found with a coin in its mouth, a pagan custom of paying for entrance into the afterlife. The beautiful bulls you see here were found in two separate burials and the distinctive shiny green, yellow and buff glaze is characteristic of a workshop of the Paphos region dating to the, excuse me, dating to the 12th century after Christ. And on the right, you see a belt buckle and a lamp bearing traces of burning around its nozzle. The church was painted with frescoes inside. And here on the top of the slide, you see a painted block that has on one side an image of a saint with a halo surrounding its head. And on the top right, you can see a close up of, of that block. On the bottom left is a beautiful Corinthian column capital. It was found being reused as a base for the altar table. And this is a practice not uncommon in Byzantine or, or medieval Christian churches that used ancient spolia. And on, on the bottom um, um, center and then bottom right, I'm showing you two examples um, where you can see that this is a practice that is still replicated today. Um, in the bottom middle, you see an altar table in the pillared crypt of the Basilica of San Sepulcro in Lazio, Italy. And on the bottom right, you see a chapel in the Church of St. Nicholas at Myra on the southern coast of Turkey. Um, and you can see a column capital is, is supporting um, an architectural block which serves as, as the altar table. Just to the north of the North Basilica was a large building that must have been one of the key public monuments of Ptolemy's new settlement. The imposing structure was located on a rise that in antiquity would have overlooked the entirety of Crisico Bay. Of this building and notice in this slide, the photograph and the plan are the reverse of each other. If you take a look at the two di um, directional arrows, arrows, you'll see that that's the case. Um, and let me just quickly explain, moving from south to north on the plan, what the Princeton team has thus far uncovered. Uh, a portico, excuse me, a porticoed courtyard mm -hmm. flanked by smaller side rooms, an open hall, another courtyard with side rooms, perhaps in two stories, and finally a porch. Notable about the southern courtyard was its surrounding colonnade, which likely included Doric columns along the sides and two imposing columns on its north end that had colorful ionic capitals and bases. So a beautifully um, decorated courtyard with Doric columns and ionic. A large amount of painted wall plaster was recovered in yellow, red, blue, and black. And you should imagine the colors were applied to the wall in rectangular configurations. The effect would have simulated color, colored marble slabs, which was the convention of first style Roman wall painting.
The courtyard also revealed a five meter deep bottle shaped cistern used for the collection and storage of, of water. And I noticed that Elizabeth Deering is here in the, in the audience and she remembers well being at the bottom of the cistern during the excavation. The cover of the cistern is outlined in red on both the drawing and the photograph. The plan in the center shows the cistern in section while the photograph on the right is taken from the bottom of the cistern looking up. Numerous vessels, both complete and fragmentary, were found at the bottom of the cistern. Many were used for the drawing and storage of water, and they range in date from the fourth to the first century BC. A cache of Scythian type arrowheads was found within the building and this has led to the credible suggestion that the building functioned as a military garrison for the newly founded city of Arsinoe. Another important area of excavation is the one you see here on the outskirts of town. It is next to the local high school and we have discovered the remains of a large monumental building. The layout has similarities to what have been identified as palaces at other Cypriot sites, so this might be the royal palace of ancient Marion. The date would be in the last quarter of the 6th century BC. The area is badly disturbed because previously it was the site of a United Nations compound. In the 1960s, the UN, as you know, was sent to the island because of difficulties between Greek and Turkish Cypriots and Polis had been a mixed village. So construction of the UN buildings and the later high school destroyed some of the earlier remains. Here is a bit more detail and you can see that the architectural remains are extremely fugitive. The structure is comprised of a series of rooms and the area furthest to the right appears to have been used for industrial purposes. Certainly metalworking was one activity and this is a feature shared with palace compounds of Iron Age Cyprus. A great help in dating has been some of the pottery found within the trenches. Particularly this imported transport amphora which dates to the late 6th century BC. Some of the most critical objects that were found were many, many fragments of imported Greek pottery. I show you some of the fragments to the left of the vertical line and what the original shapes would have looked like from comparable vessel types in museums on, on the right. The pottery is important because the fragments indicate that Marion had trade with Athens, Corinth, the East Greek islands, and other places where decorated pottery was produced and was fashionable. Large storage vessels like the two on the left were also found. Not only do they indicate that there was significant packing of goods inside the building, but transportation of materials in the ancient world was commonly by sea. And the image on the right shows you transport amphorae, how they would be stacked in a ship. You can see in the case of our amphora on the top left, how difficult it was for our conservators to piece the vessel back together from many broken fragments and that also necessitated uh, taking the photograph at the top uh, left upside down. Although the areas of the excavation that I've shown you so far are important, what you see here is very, very significant. From the green field surrounding the excavated area, you can see that we are on the outskirts of Polis. What we discovered was an extensive sanctuary, a quite impressive religious center. The complex dated to between 750 and 450 BC when it finally went out of use. During that time, it had been destroyed and rebuilt and construction underwent several phases. The large complex contained a multi-roomed area with an outdoor altar in a large pit where unwanted materials from the sanctuary were thrown in. In all, we found thousands of objects and over 25,000 fragments of sculpture made out of terracotta, fired clay. 
Once again, with this slide, you can see how very close to the surface the ancient remains are. And since the sanctuary is located in what is now an agricultural field, it is certain that some of the upper levels of the buildings, as well as any of the objects that were dedicated in the complex had been plowed away. I had mentioned that we discovered over 25,000 fragments of sculpture all made out of clay. The majority were in the form of figurines, no higher than about 15 centimeters in height. The major type was female with her arms lifted up into the air. The figure I've outlined in thick black is particularly important because her presence tells us what kind of deity was worshiped. Throughout the ancient Near East, female figurines holding their breasts are linked with goddesses who ruled over fertility, particularly the Canaanite and Phoenician goddess Astarte. So in this sanctuary, the many female representations were offered to a divinity whose influence was coming from the Near East and was associated with abundance and fertility. Female heads of various sizes ranging from life size in the middle to figurine size on the left and statuette on the right were once attached to bodies. If you look closely at the facial features, they reflect the skill level of various artists, diverse attention to detail and different ways of treating hair and headdresses. Stylistic sources are those coming from the Near East. Other objects found in the sanctuary, and they were all intended as gifts for the deity, reflect influences emanating from outside of Cyprus. A few of the objects that were recovered are Egyptianizing, that, like the relief sculpture on the left and the little faience figurine of a man on the right. The item in the middle is an inscribed cylinder seal, a barrel-shaped stone with an engraved scene on it. In the Marian sanctuary, we also found other objects that would have been associated with the religious worship that took place. There were several incense burners on top of which fragrance, spices, and incense would be burned to honor the god. And um, these would be um, the left-hand image as well as um, the bottom left. I, I think you can see that um, fairly well. Bronze bowls and luxury items would be dedicated as gifts for the deity. Various specialized juglets were also part of the, item, the items important for the cult, like the one with the animal head in the top middle. Oops, then I'll see if we can advance two more. There we go. Other gifts to the goddess were also significant. Several masks were found like the ones I show you here. Masks were common, commonly used in the Near East and worn in cult ritual where foretelling the future was practiced. In the Marian sanctuary, we have many figurines of small representations of trees. They're called sacred trees and were part of the paraphernalia used in religious worship in the Near East where fertility deities were venerated. The fifth area where the Princeton team excavated was also in the confines within the town of Polis. The structure was located in an open field next to a house and just to the west of one of the town streets. In this area, we also uncovered another temple complex, which was slightly later in date than the one we had just looked at. This one had a primary building resembling a temple with a cella and a front porch and a courtyard in front. The temple was positioned next to the city wall of ancient Marion. Within the temple area, the building and the courtyard, and within the space next to the city wall, we found nearly 5,000 fragments of sculpture made out of clay. Once again, these items were intended as gifts for the divinity that was worshiped here. We don't have any inscriptions that tell us who the deity was, but a very important statuette from the sanctuary gives us a critical clue. A standing draped woman has a young nude boy at her side. On his back are two holes, and this is very curious. What were the holes used for? 
In Greek art, when a woman is represented with a male child with wings at his shoulders, we know we are dealing with the divine mother and son pair, Aphrodite and Eros, who both inspire love. So to find in the Marian temple, the statuette of the draped female and a nude boy tells us two things. Aphrodite was the goddess who was worshiped and she was venerated as a Greek deity and not one from the Near East as was the case in the other Marian sanctuary. In the Marian Aphrodite and Eros statuette Detachable wings would have filled the holes, excuse me, the holes in the god's shoulder. Another figurine from the temple, this one of the goddess Aphrodite represented nude, but surrounded by swirling drapery, reinforces that it was the Greek goddess who was worshipped. Her son Eros is represented in other figurines. I show you two depictions of the nude young boy, although there were several others that were found in the sanctuary. There were dozens of heads of female figurines, and these are but three. You can see that their style is refined and naturalistic in keeping with what would have been current and fashionable in the Greek world. Heads of larger figures were also found like these too. Artists used molds to represent the faces. And again, the sensitivity of the treatment reflects the Greek sculptural style that was very much appreciated on, on Cyprus at ancient Marion. Most dramatic of all was the colossal statue of a male figure that was found in various pieces within the temple complex. Cypriot artists did not at all mind that heads could be out of proportion to other body parts. And in the case of this statue, he was about three meters tall, nearly 10 feet in height. And you can see that the head is, is much smaller in relation to the rest of the body. The remains of the statue were found within the temple and he would have dominated the interior of the structure. We might ask the question, what was a male statue doing in a temple dedicated to a female goddess. Later ancient authors record that there was once a sanctuary at Marion that was dedicated to two gods who were worshiped by the Greeks, Zeus, the king of the gods and Aphrodite. The images you see here are Roman copies of the heads of original Greek statues that no longer survive. And of course the heads are, are found in museums outside of Cyprus. What reinforces the possibility that the sanctuary we have been discussing was also dedicated to Zeus is the fact that coins that were minted at Marion like this one, a silver diobel, have a portrait of Zeus on one side and an image of Aphrodite on the other. This coin dates to the reign of the last king of Marion, Stasi Oikos II, who ruled from 330 to 312 BC. The reason for the hole in the coin is to show that at one time in the past, the coin was taken out of circulation and no longer had value. Although it's been suggested that the hole might have been the result of testing the quality of the metal. So the numismatic evidence supports that the large male statue within the Marin sanctuary might have been dedicated to Zeus. A series of bearded male heads of figure size found in the sanctuary also, also bolsters the argument that a male deity was worshiped alongside a female. Once again, you can see the naturalistic style used to represent the face refers back to a mainland Greek tradition. Other objects appropriate to a male god are horse and rider figurines and chariots. And with the one on the upper left, I show you also the inside where the chariot car has room for two occupants. One would have been the driver and the other a warrior, both made out of clay. You likely have noticed, and I show you more examples here, that the sculptural material coming from the later Marian sanctuary is heavily damaged. Heads are separated from bodies. Bodies have no heads and larger heads like the beautiful statue face have been deliberately mutilated. In 
Many pieces of sculpture were found bearing traces of burning. The front of the torso of the figurine on the top left is gray in color from burning and the discoloration of the statue head with wreath shows that it was subjected to fire. With the two other heads, the faces were deliberately damaged, causing part of the head to break away. And on the bottom left, you can see where a sharp object, perhaps the tip of a spear, pierced the top of the statue head. Damage is very well seen on this statue head. I call your attention to the right side of the neck in the area of the shadow, which I've enlarged. There's a chunk missing out of the neck made from striking with a pointed object at this very spot. And this would have caused the head to crack off from the body at the neck. As we were digging in the sanctuary, and this is one of our excavation photos, not only did we discover nearly every object broken or deliberately mutilated, but there was burnt building debris and an ash layer about 10, excuse me, 10 centimeters thick covering the entire area, indicating that there had been a massive fire. Our best guess for what had happened is that the soldiers of Ptolemy came to the sanctuary and in the destruction of Marion, they desecrated the temple by breaking all of the sculpture and then sent the tub, excuse me, and then set the temple on fire. After this event, Marion ceased to exist. Throughout this lecture, you've seen some examples of the terracotta sculpture that our team has recovered. And what I would like to do next is spend just a little bit of time saying a bit more about the 30,000 fragments that I'm studying and preparing for publication. With so much sculpture to analyze, there have been lots of difficulties, and the most pressing is that of time. A project like this could take two lifetimes, but that's why student assistants are great. In our excavation storeroom, they record important data on the computer, they measure and draw, and they help with photography. They're very good at sweeping and they don't mind contorting themselves into awkward positions, to get the job done. They seem to take considerable delight in dealing with dead rats. An important note, you should never wear flip-flops on an archeological excavation. And this is one of the reasons why. And of course, I'm directing your attention to the right-hand slide. Other species spawn critical inquiry in our students, and I can only imagine what is going on in the minds of these two as they minutely examine an unusual centipede. But back to sculpture. One major difficulty is that the sculpture ranges in date over a 400 year span, and in the ancient world, styles can differ markedly. So organizing and assessing the sculpture stylistically can pose problems because the variety is immense. And here are some examples. In the left, the pair of draped female torsos shows a handmade figurine with painted details on her dress and a later figurine who has been made in a mold and wears the latest fashion popular around 500 BC, a linen chiton and draped hematin with its fussy pleats. The hands below pair an earlier example with, example with swollen hand and spindly fingers to a later one that is more anatomically correct and far more naturalistic. The two columns of female figurine heads show how style has changed over the course of time from the top to bottom. In the upper right, we see the pairing of life-size female feet with the left having elongated toes of equal length well, the artist of the other foot included the nail beds, the bony structure of the toes, and they even distinguished the sandal straps of the footgear worn by the statue. The, excuse me, the male heads below reflect the same thing, the evolution of style. The figurine head that looks like a space alien is clearly the earliest of the three. So one of the aspects of our sculpture that we have been studying is the evolution of sculptural style over time and the nature of stylistic influences. 
In many ways, the terracotta sculpture from the Princeton excavations provides the ideal corpus for a study of the choroplastic arts. Nearly all of the 30,000 fragments of sculpture come from these two sanctuaries, so the context is secure as well as the date. Remember, the classical sanctuary has affinities with Greek architecture and was likely dedicated to Zeus and Aphrodite. The earlier archaic sanctuary reflects more Near Eastern commonalities and layout, and the figural votives show influences coming from the East and appropriate for a female fertility goddess. These statue heads reflect another important issue, the impact of foreign styles on Marian sculpture. You can readily see that all the heads look different. This is not so much due to date, but rather to the stylistic source and the ethnicity of who is being represented. The life-size head on the left has its closest parallels to Nubian sculpture just south of Egypt with its fleshy lips, large eyes, and broad face. The middle head is Levantine in type, and here I mean Phoenician. She has a small mouth, a long nose, and if you could see it in profile, the nose is hooked bulging eyes, but excuse me, bushy eyebrows and a thin face. The head on the right is inspired by Greek physiognomic facial features, oval eyes with upper and lower, lower lids, a nose with a broad bridge, a small mouth with parted lips and an oval shaped head. Clearly the different artists responsible for these heads were expert at capturing key features that reflected the ethnic origins of who was represented. Notice other variations. The hair is treated differently in each. Closely coiled locks looking like dreadlocks for the Nubian, snail shell curls along the forehead for the Levantine head, and naturalistic tufted hair for the Greek. There is another important difference among the heads. The Nubian and Levantine heads were handmade with the structure of the head made from clay coils, while the Greek head had its face made from a mold, and the hair and back of the head were separately made from applied clay. The hair, jewelry, and the headgear of each were individually added, and the pointy bits of clay on the top of the Greek head are the remains of leaves. He would have been wearing a wreath. To properly study the terracotta sculpture, it's important to establish typologies, date the material, and determine details and sources of style and foreign influences as we just saw. What is equally critical is to assess the technical properties of each object and to understand how it was made. There are diverse ways to make a terracotta figurine or statue, but production is limited to a few common strategies and here are some of the basic ones. All of our sculpture has been analyzed in terms of its technique, but this can be more problematic than it might first seem. Let's take an example. Among all of the sculpture that we've determined were made by the use of molds, we've counted 49 different molded figural types. Some of those categories are male figurine heads, seated female figurine statue heads, figurine horse heads, the list goes on. So 49 different individual molded types. Within each type, we've identified that a variety of molds were used in manufacture as you see here. On the top, you see the type female figurine, excuse me, excuse me. On the top, you see the type female figurine heads and we've counted 37 distinct molds that were used. And here I'm showing you only seven different mold types. Below are draped female figurine bodies and you see six out of the 67 different drapery types that we've tabulated among our corpus. Keeping track of the types, their association with other objects linkage to the excavation database, and a comprehensive photographic archive requires attention to detail that is not for the faint-hearted.
Close observation is of course key and our team spends focused time with each object. I am convinced that we will never understand the method of an ancient artisan and appreciate the technical decisions that were made in crafting an object until we enter the process ourselves. To that end, basic equipment is a must and we document and record every object we examine. Most of what we use and what I would recommend are not at all extensive or expensive. We couldn't live without a handheld microscope and I use a micronta that has a lighted ocular mag magnification of 30 times. It is great for identifying fugitive pigments and detailing clay inclusions. The pull-out 10 times eye magnifier is helpful for less precise viewing. Digital dial calipers are the only item we use for measuring and plastic guarantees objects won't be scratched. Jointed calipers, and we have aluminum, are used for larger items and then of course we need a measuring tape. A soft brush like a barber's brush comes in handy for cleaning objects. And I readily refer to Anna Shepard's Ceramics for the Archaeologist for specific questions I have when, when potter's friends aren't around. More recently, I've adopted a handheld digital scope, readily affordable for about $40, that allows for various magnifications so we can study inclusions more precisely. Because it attaches via a USB cable to a computer, you can see blown up on blowing up what you're looking at on the screen and I'm not at all re recommending that you scan your eyeball as um, what is doing what is happening here in this ad for the microscope. What I'm also showing you here are two heads from our excavation and you can see the scan of each um, that shows us something of the composition of the clay. Study of the inclusions is very valuable to gauge the quality of the clay and to determine if there is added temper. And this is important to know if a coroplast has augmented its fabric. The first step in understanding how a coroplast approached his craft is to consider how clay was acquired. Natural erosion and now road cuts reveal clay beds and once located, clay is not difficult to mine and collect. And the view on the bottom uh, the left bottom shows an example of a clay bed on the edge of polis. Ethnoarchaeologists have determined that traditional potters usually gather clay within a radius of one and a half kilometers from their workshop. So clay sources tend to be local and collecting clay could be done by anyone. Raw clay almost always has to be purified. Stones and sticks must be removed and sediments have to be sorted. Likely this was done by water levigation. We have evidence of a clay settling basin from ancient Arsinoe, and we know that clay was purified in Athens by means of huge settling tanks with water. Refined clay often has to be adjusted by a coroplast to improve its workability. By handling the clay, a coroplast will assess its plasticity and often added temper might be necessary to reduce shrinkage and aid in drying. This is where a microscope is essential to determine what kinds of temper and how much was added. Our students have mined clay, purified it, and have become familiar with this part of the process. There has been a major lacuna in the study of terracotta sculpture, and that is not truly understanding how the material was manipulated in the decisions an artisan made in crafting an object. I must admit that this is one of the aspects of choroplastic study that fascinates me the most. So in our study of the terracotta sculpture from the excavation, we've taken on a new approach. What truly motivated us to try something different was a figurine type that was common in one of the Marian sanctuaries. It's a small object and is no more than seven centimeters in height. We've counted 154 representations, some of which you see here, and they span different types 
with the most diagnostic resembling a plant form. They appear to be miniature versions of sacred trees. The variety of shapes and the various types of details were fascinating. Nearly everyone was different, and I started to wonder about the thought process that went on in the mind of whoever crafted these objects. So in the last couple of years, I've been working with students on a technical project to replicate some of our figurines. Instead of clay, we use plasticine, Play-Doh, and frequent trips to Jumbo and the Papas Mall have kept us well stocked. The material is inexpensive, and early on I decided it would be useful to use different colors for separate steps of the process for making additive figurines so we could visually track how a choroplast had proceeded. One of my graduate students, Casey Gibson, worked with me on how to craft this particular sacred tree, and it is not as simple as it looks, so I'd like to take you through the steps. And looking at this closely, we can come to understand in a more profound way the mind of an ancient choroplast. With this object, you can see that it's hollow and that its surface has a loop pattern, but the form wasn't merely built by adding loops. Another view from the side and one looking from the top show that the loops had been added over another form, which was hollow and tapered toward the top. In essence, the loops were added around a hollow cone. But how do you make a hollow cone? You start with a lump of clay. You can roll a ball and press a finger into the ball, a method common in making pinch pots, but the interior is wide. We've tried this method and getting the clay into a shape of a cone by pressing the sides together deforms it. You could roll the clay into a thick coil as above right and then stick your finger into one end, but this doesn't result in an interior that is narrow at the top and widens at the bottom. I'm sorry, my screen is not cooperating. So um, hold on just one second. Um, Page 18 at the bottom. Perfect, got it. Um, looking more closely at the interior and in a slightly, slightly raking light, we could see faint concentric marks that circle around the inside of the interior. Gently running a finger along the interior surface, these marks can be felt. What we finally concluded was that the cone shape was formed by being simply thrown on the potter's wheel. Looking at the image on the right, imagine that the potter continued pulling up the clay so the top would be nearly closed. He then would cut his form off the wheel just above the bottom of his thrown cone-shaped object and he would have a hollow cone. So Casey laboriously made a hollow cone in the top left view, looking like it had come off the wheel and the bottom left shows the object's correct orientation. Casey also observed that there was a thickened bottom so she rightly concluded that there had to have been an extra added element to widen the resting surface. And you can see where the choroplast had not totally blended the added element at the bottom of the cone. Casey took a bit, a small bit of clay, rolled a narrow coil, added it to the outer bottom of the cone, and then smoothed the two pieces together. Notice that she is using index finger and thumb as tools. Now Casey was ready to turn to the surface decoration, the applied loops. After studying the object and noting what loop, what loop overlapped other elements, she confirmed that four separate loops had been placed around the bottom two thirds of the cone. Starting with a ball of different color plasticine, she rolled a coil. Once she achieved the correct length, she made a loop and attached it just above the bottom of the cone. 
Casey is holding the object in the center right bottom on the basis of small indentations she could feel on the outside of the original object where the choroplast fingers would have rested. Notice at the bottom right how Casey had tried to create the same press marks on the ends of the loop as the choroplast had. With the first loop applied, Casey had to determine what the choroplast did next. Did he place the second loop opposite or adjacent to the first loop? If opposite, this would imply a choroplast was deliberately thinking how to fill the available space evenly with four separate loops. If he works in sequentially in a single direction, that meant that he intended to eyeball how much space a subsequent loop should fill. Casey studied how the bottoms of the loops overlapped each other on the original object and, um, and determined that the choroplast made adjacent applications to the right of the previous placed loop. So another clay ball, formation of coil, bending to create a loop and application to the surface. This was done another time with a third loop applied to the upper right. Notice that the empty space for the fourth loop is rather broad, forcing the choroplast to have to make a wider loop to fill the area. With the bottom loops in place, the next step was to apply the first loop that crossed over the top of the cone. A different color plasticine designated it as an element separate from the bottom zone. A narrow clay coil was rolled and then attached to one side with the smooth marks mimicking what was detected on the original and then the other side affixed in place. The last element was the other coil that would be placed perpendicular to the previous roll on top of the object. A, a yellow coil was rolled out and affixed in place with the ends firmly joined to the apex of two of the loops in the bottom row. Now you see all four sides completed and the constructed object paired with the original. And here is a very happy Casey. There were significant differences in the undersides of other sacred trees. This one has a slightly concave bottom and flaring base. From the size and angle of the indentation on the original, we were able to determine that it was the right thumb of the choroplast that was used to make the depression. Examining closely the surface of the original, we were able to determine from the slight indentations in the object that this is the way the object would have been held in the hand, the left hand, with the forefinger braced against the side of the solid cone as individual leaves were applied in separate vertical columns. We determined that the choroplast worked from the top down because lower leaves slightly overlapped the one above. The purpose of the flaring base, of course, was to allow the object to be self-standing. There was a different approach used with this object. Instead of a shallow flaring depression at the bottom, here the depression is deep. It had been made by inserting the thumb deeply into a solid clay cone and the base only slightly flares. We handled the original in scores of different positions using the right and then the left hand and we came up with the following. The hollow lower interior allowed for positioning the cone on the left thumb while bracing the exterior against the back of the index finger. You see this in the in the two images second from the right. This left the right hand free and the choroplast used the tip of the forefinger of this hand to gouge the cone surface in vertical columns around the exterior surface. Although self-standing, the true purpose of the deep cavity in the bottom of the object was to allow the left thumb to serve as a mount for the object while the choroplast worked. This next object truly stumped us for quite a while. Not only is it beautifully and cleverly made, but the bottom was flat 
and the hole was quite narrow. Clearly the hole was not made by a finger or for the insertion of one. We thought it possibly was a vent hole, but the object is not solidly constructed, so this made no sense. We finally measured the depth of the hole by the pull-out section of our calipers and were surprised that the hole went as far as the bottom of the first loop, as you see with the red arrow. However, the hole did not pierce through the, did not pierce through the loop. So what function did the hole serve? The hole allowed for the entire object to be constructed around a narrow elongated object, likely a stick, and the seemingly intricate construction was not complicated at all. By holding one end of the stick, the coroplast applied successive coils of clay with the first one around the tip of the stick. Additional loops of clay were positioned overlapping the previous one at a right angle. When the requisite number of loops had been applied, the stick was removed, leaving a narrow space. The coroplast then slightly flared the bottom of the object so it could stand and then cut horizontally across the bottom with a knife to produce a flat resting surface. And this was a rather ingenious solution. Not all of our attempts were equally successful. And here you can see not only the variation in size, but the merits of using plasticine over gray clay to document the shape. So what did we learn? While making an object, an artisan leaves finger impressions everywhere. And the surest indication of how the material was treated, pressed or smoothed, finger marks tell us plenty. They always reflect the immediate presence of the coroplast. Studying an object is critical. Surface details provide important information how an artist proceeded, whether it is the finger mark, and I'm not sure you can see that, but there's a finger impression within the black oval. Um, we might sometimes see final smoothing of the surface with a finger or perhaps a cloth and this is indicated by the red arrow. Or we can determine how careful or not an artisan was to blend separate elements together. And this you see um, at the point of the black arrows. Whoops, I'm sorry guys, this is my little cat who's hopping on the screen. Uh, next slide, please. This has led to the next phase of our study, the cataloging of fingerprints. Close examination can reveal the finger impressions left by an artisan, and you can faintly see two examples within the red outlines. Additional study can determine how the object was being held in the hand, what finger was used that left the print, and whether the maker was right or left-handed. I've worked with the Dynolite Digital Microscope Company, and with grant money, I was able to, able to purchase one of their microscopes that allowed for the scanning of fingerprints, in particular, those impressions left on ancient objects. And this scope costs about $860. So in the summer of 2019, Casey and I began scanning, and here she is at work. The microscope allows for various magnification, different light filters, automatic, automatic measurement calibration, and other features. Here is one of the objects we scanned, another sacred tree, and you can see the scan at the bottom right. We've been in touch with other scholars about setting up databases, and the information we will amass in the future looks promising. Forensic studies of fingerprints report that the sex of the individual can actually be determined because of the differences in width and depth of ridges, male versus female. And even the ethnicity can be postulated because there are quantifiable differences that have been observed. Analysis has been done by some researchers on Mesopotamian clay tablets, so we're excited about the possibilities for our material. 
Once the pandemic is over and we can travel again, we'll be back at work. And next time I promise to have much more to tell you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Wow, that was a very rich presentation with all sorts of information. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all those with us. You're welcome. We've learned, we've learned everything actually from uh, <laughs> your last seasons of work at uh, Polis, from the Chen Operatoire of uh, all sorts of terracottas, especially the handmade ones, the trees, the sacred trees, to the impact of you know, foreign stars and reflection of ethnic origins of who was represented. Uh, everything is so fascinating, but I, I will let uh, other people speak. And uh, perhaps there are questions that are already, um... yes.